Welcome to part two of Is This the Mind-Blowing Truth About Our History? Where we explore the questions, who are we? Where did we come from? And why are we here? I will now read the chapter Imagery and Trial from the Book of Kim, which is the sixth book of the Ringing Cedars book series written by Vladimir Megre. It was published in 2002. Toward the end of the Vedic age of human life, a great discovery began to take place. A discovery unparalleled over the whole course of the history of human civilizations on the earth. People became acutely aware of the power of collective thought. And here we must clarify, what exactly is the thought of man? The thought of man is an energy unparalleled anywhere in space. It is capable of creating marvelous worlds on the one hand or, on the other, weapons capable of destroying the planet. And all the matter that we see today without exception has been created by thought. Nature, the animal kingdom, man himself have all been created with great inspiration by the divine thought. And the proliferation of artificial objects, machines and mechanical devices which we see today are the creations of man's thought. You may think that it is man's hand that has produced them. Yes, today hands must be employed, but to begin with, everything down to the last detail is created by thought. It is believed today that man's thought is more perfect now than in the past, but that is far from being the case. For each member of the Vedic civilization, it was many millions of times superior to that of modern man in terms of the speed and fullness of information involved. This can be seen in the knowledge we have taken from the past about using plants for medicines and food. But nature's devices are far more perfect and complex than anything artificial. It was not just that man summoned a whole lot of beasts to serve him. It was not just a case of defining the function of all growing things. Once he realized the power of collective thought, he found that he could use it to control even the weather or cause springs to well up from the depths of the earth. If he were not careful in handling his thought, he could make a bird fall from the sky while in flight, or affect life on distant stars, either to plant gardens on them or to utterly destroy them. This is no fiction but fact and it was all given to mankind. Everyone today knows how man, having launched himself on the path of technocracy, has been attempting to build spaceships capable of reaching the stars. People have gone to the moon but only by wasting valuable resources and energies and with great harm to the earth. But they have changed nothing on the moon. This kind of approach is short-sighted. It is doomed to failure and it is dangerous for everyone on the earth as well as for other planets. There is another approach which is much more effective. Through thought alone it is possible to grow a flower on the moon, create an atmosphere capable of supporting human life plant a garden there and find oneself with one's beloved in that garden in the flesh. But before that can happen, thought must transform the whole earth into a flourishing paradise garden, and that has to be done through collective thinking. Collective thought is indeed powerful. In the whole universe there is no energy that can interfere with its operation. Matter and today's technology are the reflection of collective thought. It is this collective thought that has invented all the mechanical devices and armaments we have today. But remember, I was saying that in those Vedic times, every living man's thought had far greater power and energy than now. Objects, such as rocks weighing many tons, could be moved by as few as nine people gathered together. To make it easier to use collective thought for the benefit of the majority without wasting time getting a whole lot of people to congregate in one place, people invented images of various gods and began to control nature with their help. The sun god appeared in its own image, likewise the gods of fire, rain, love and fertility. Everything needed for life was created by people through images on which human thought was concentrated. It performed many useful acts. Rain, for example, was necessary for watering the ground and so one person directed his thought just to the image of the rain god. When rain was really essential, then a whole lot of people concentrated their energy on the image of rain. When enough energy had been accumulated in the image, the clouds gathered and the rain fell, watering the harvests. Unlimited opportunity has been given to man 
by the divine nature. If mankind could only overcome the temptations associated with unlimited authority and hold all the energies of the universe in perfect balance within themselves, then gardens, as the fruit of human thought, would appear in other galaxies, and man would be capable of happifying other worlds with his thought. What is called the age of the image was now coming into bloom. In it man not only created, but felt himself to be a god. But then what else could the Son of God turn out to be? In what is called the age of the image, man exists in the likeness of God and begins to create his own images. This period lasts 9,000 years. And God does not interfere in man's deeds. All the diverse energies of the universe are set in motion and actively try to seduce man. Particles of all the diverse energies of the universe are to be found in man. They exist in great numbers and play opposite roles. But all the particles of the divine energies of the universe ought to be perfectly balanced, brought together in a harmonious whole. If one of these particles dominates, the rest are denigrated and their harmony is disrupted and then, then the earth is transformed and becomes inharmonious. Images can lead people to a many splendored creation, but if their inner unity is surrendered, they can also lead to annihilation. But what exactly is an image? An image is an entity of energy invented by human thought. It can be created by a single man or by several together. A clear example of the collective creation of an image may be seen in stage acting. One man describes the image on paper while another portrays the described image on the stage. What happens to the actor who portrays the image invented? For a time the actor exchanges his own feelings, aspirations and desires for those inherent in the invented image. In the process the actor may change the way he walks, his facial expression, his usual clothing. In this way the invented image acquires a temporary embodiment. The ability to create image is something only man is endowed with. The image created by man can remain in space only so long as it is held in man's thought, either by a single man or by several at once. The greater the number of people feeding the image with their feelings, the stronger it becomes. The image created by the collective thought can possess colossal destructive or creative potential. It has a reciprocal connection with people and is capable of shaping character and behavior on the part of groups of people both large and small. In exploiting the great possibilities they have discovered within themselves, people became carried away with creating the life of the planet. But it happened back in the early stages of the age of the image in the life of man that there were six people, just six, who found themselves unable to hold within their bodies, hearts and minds the balance of those energies of the universe which God gave to man upon creating him. Perhaps they needed to make their appearance to test all mankind. At first, it was in just one of the six that the energy of grandeur and self-importance predominated. Then in another, and then in a third, and finally in all six. They did not meet together at first. Each one lived independently. But like attracts like, and they ended up concentrating their thought on how to become masters of all the peoples of the earth. There were six of them, and in public they referred to themselves as priests. Through the process of reincarnating themselves over the centuries, they are still living to this day. Today, all the peoples of the earth are governed by just six people. These are the priests. Their dynasties are 10,000 years old. From generation to generation they have been transmitting their knowledge of the occult to their heirs, along with the science of imagery which was also partially known to them. They have taken great pains to hide the Vedic knowledge from other people. Among the six, there is one who is considered chief, and he is called the High Priest. Today he considers himself to be the chief ruler of human society. Through a few sentences I have uttered which you have recorded in your books, as well as through the reaction of many people to them, the High Priest has begun to suspect who I really am. Just in case, he attempted to destroy me by using a negligible amount of power. He did not succeed. He was surprised and he has tried again applying a greater amount of force, still not completely convinced of who I am. Now I have uttered the word Vedrus, 
thereby exposing myself completely. The current high priest living on the earth today is afraid even of the word Vedrus. You can just imagine how shaken he is, since he knows what lies behind it. Now he will muster his soldiers, bio-robots to a man, along with the forces of all the dark occult sciences to bring about my termination. And he himself will be working minute by minute on a plan of annihilation. Let him do that. It means he will not have time to be busy with his other plans. You were telling me about the angry attacks in the recent press, Vladimir. Now you will see them intensify even more, and they will be even more cunning and sophisticated. You will see slander and provocation. You will see the whole arsenal of devices, which the dark forces have been using over the millennia to bring about the devastation of our people's culture. But what you will see at the beginning is only the tip of the iceberg. Not all people can witness the occult attacks at first hand. But you will understand them, you will feel them, you will see them. Do not be afraid of them, I beg of you. What is fearsome is powerless to affect a fearless man. Whatever you see, you should forget immediately and forever. No matter how omnipotent a monster may seem, once it is forgotten, it ceases to exist altogether. This is an unusual fact, and I can tell you're doubting. Do not be hasty to give in to your doubts. Think it over calmly. After all, even a small group of people who have gathered together for the purpose of building something inevitably has a leader. We may call him a ruler. A small enterprise has an official in charge. A large enterprise has several people in charge under a chief executive officer. There are many rulers over all sorts of territories which are known by different names, provinces, regions, states, communities, republics, etc. The particular name is not important. Each nation has a ruler who is aided by a whole host of assistants. The ruler of a nation, is that the limit? That is what people often think. Does that mean nobody is governing the whole human society living on the earth? And are there no claimants wishing to ascend the throne of the earth? There have indeed been claimants. There still are. You know from recent history many names of military commanders who have tried to dominate the world by force. But not one of them has ever succeeded in taking power over the world. Whenever they found themselves close to seizing universal authority, something would inevitably happen resulting in the destruction of both the pretender to world domination and his army. And the nation aspiring to world domination, which before had been considered strong and flourishing, suddenly dropped to the level of a run-of-the-mill state. That is the way it has always happened over the past 10,000 years. But why? All because there is already a secret ruler in the world and has been for a long time. He toys with nations and their rulers along with individual people. He calls himself the High Priest of the whole earth, while his five assistants refer to themselves as priests. Consider one other fact, Vladimir. Think about how in various parts of the earth, over the millennia, wars between people have never ceased. In every country, crime, disease and various disasters are increasing day by day, but there has been a strict, indeed the strictest prohibition on discussing a particular question. Is human civilization really on the path of progress? Or is human society being further degraded with each passing day? There can be but one simple answer to such a question. Only first take a look and see how the priests acquired their authority and how they have managed to maintain it to date. Their first step leading to the accomplishment of their secret purpose was the creation of the Egyptian state. The Egyptian state is more familiar than others to historians of today. But once you eliminate personal commentary and mysticism and look only at the facts, you will be able to uncover many secrets. Fact number one. History calls the Pharaoh the supreme ruler of Egypt, and the many military achievements and defeats of the Pharaohs of old have been well documented. Even today their magnificent tombs astound the imagination and prompt scholars to probe the mysteries they hold. Nevertheless, the grandeur of the pyramids distracts us from the most important secret of all. Not only were the pharaohs considered as rulers over all the people, but they were worshipped as gods. 
It was to them that the people turned with pleas for an auspicious crop year, pleas for rain, and an absence of pernicious winds. History can tell us about many of the factual accomplishments of the pharaohs, but after learning all these historical facts, you should ask yourself, could any of the pharaohs really have been a ruler over a large nation state, let alone a god over the people? And once you weigh all the evidence, you will realize entirely on your own that the pharaoh was nothing more than a bio robot in the hands of the priests. Now here are the facts, they're also known to us from history. During the age of the pharaohs, there also existed priests in magnificent temples and one of them was the high priest. There were always several candidates for the pharaohship in training under their supervision. Among them, the priests would inculcate in the young boys whatever the priests desired among them the notion that the pharaoh was chosen by God. Along with this they told them that the high priest himself could hear God speaking to him in a secret temple. Later the priests would decide which of the candidates would become the next pharaoh. And so the day of the coronation arrived. The new pharaoh clothed in special robes and holding the symbols of office in his hands took his place majestically on the throne. In the eyes of the people he was an omnipotent king, a god. Only the priests knew that it was their own bio robot that sat on the throne. And having studied the new pharaoh's character from his childhood, they knew exactly how he would rule, they knew what gifts he would offer up to the benefit of the priesthood. There was the occasional attempt on the part of certain pharaohs to come out from under the high priest's authority, but none of them ever succeeded in becoming a free man. After all, the power of the priests was just as invisible as the pharaoh's royal robes were visible to all. You see, the priest's authority did not require any verbal proclamation or manifest communication for its enforcement. After all, in exercising their power over any individual ruler, the priests did not relent even for a moment, and it was exercised over the masses in turn with the aid of invented suggestions as to what constitutes the order of the universe. If only the pharaoh could have liberated himself from the images inculcated in him by the priests and reflected by himself in peace, perhaps he would have been able to become a real man. There was no way the pharaoh could free himself from the day-to-day -day cares and concerns. This had been part of the plan right from the start. And what concerns there were? Couriers, scribes and local governors by turns brought in a daily flood of information from all over the vast nation. Situations calling for immediate solutions. And then a war would break out absorbing the ruler's full attention. And the pharaoh would take his chariot and keep following his daily trajectories, respecting or rejecting the deeds of his subjects, often not getting enough sleep himself. The priest on the other hand would spend his time quietly reflecting and in this lay his greatest advantage. The priest directed his efforts to gaining single-handed control of the world as a whole. And even more than that, he meditated on how to resurrect his own world, distinct from the world God has created. And did he care in the least about the stupid boy pharaoh, not to mention the crowds which were subject to the pharaoh? For the priest they were all merely toys. The priests studied the science of imagery in secret while the masses of people remembered less and less about the law of nature. It was the priest Vladimir who challenged the energy of the interaction between people and the living deity, the creations of nature. Into the temples they had invented, they fed on it, the energy of the people giving nothing in return. What had been surely clear to everyone in the age of Vedic culture now became obscure and surreptitious. The people became stupefied as though under a hypnotic spell and unthinkingly followed the commands in a kind of semi-sleep. And they began to destroy the world of the divine nature while building an artificial world for the priests' benefit. The priests held their science under the strictest secretive control. They did not even dare write it all down on scrolls. They invented a language of their own for communication with each other. And this is a fact you can also learn from history. They needed a different language lest someone should inadvertently overhear their conversation with each other and become party to their secrets. And so even today these simple truths, which have now become shrouded in a cloak of secrecy, are passed down to new generations of the priesthood.
to be continued. Hey, it's John Nolan here. I'm so excited to share my new song, Faith in Me, with you. It's about the journey so many of us are on in these times. Go to johnnolan.bandcamp.com to listen or click on the link down below.